I'm actually not giving our message today, but I do have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker. So those of you who are a part of Mosaic and have been here for any amount of time, you already know this, but if you don't know this, our name is not just a name, but it is really, um, it's a reality of who we are, how God has brought together these different groups and congregations. We've got people from The Rock, we've got um, Bellevue, Faith Mountain, we've got different affiliations that we're a part of like Converge and MB, and then we have a, just a great mix of people who come from different faith traditions as well, who make up this wonderful mosaic, and God has just taken all of these pieces that individually are unique and, and beautiful in their own way and made something so much more beautiful. And today's special guest is a part of our MB family. So we have John Wiebe, who is the president and CEO of the MB Foundation. It's a role that he has served in since 1998. And their vision is to encourage biblical stewardship, resulting in the gathering, managing, and distributing of resources for Christ and his kingdom. And so he's going to share with us today about generosity. His uh, qualifications are extensive, but I got to be honest, I think probably the most important qualification in this arena is he looks a lot like Dave Ramsey. So um, would you give a warm mosaic welcome to our speaker, John Wiebe. Thank you, Ben. So it's been mentioned a number of times that I look like Dave. I always like to say that Dave looks like me. I don't know, for some reason that, that feels like it shifts the conversation a little bit, um, but, but that's never been used in an introduction before. So, um, you know, it's first, a lot of firsts here today. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, it's very nostalgic for me to be with you. Nostalgic for me, for my wife, she sits over here with me and Hopefully you'll get a chance to meet the better half. In 1987, my wife and I moved from a small town in Kansas, and we moved to the corner of Hamden and Wadsworth and came to join this church on this corner as I was youth pastor, I was lawn keeper, I was softball field manager. Um, you know, I had one of those jobs, worship leader. I did all kinds of things. None of it well, but I, I did all kinds of stuff. Um, where I'm standing now, we used to hide Easter eggs, okay? This was grass, and this was, this was where I mowed, and this is where the kids played. Um, the lawn went all the way to the street. We didn't have that big ditch out in front. Um, the first sermon I preached was in Bellevue Acres, and I was probably 100 yards from here, and that was a long time ago. Uh, but that's a little bit of, of my connection, my sentimental journey um, and connection to this mosaic church and this being a part of you as a body of Christ. MB stands for Mennonite Brethren, so you're part of the Mennonite Brethren family. Uh, whether you know what that means or not, I'd be happy to visit with you more about it, but that's not the point this morning, but to say that we're, we're part of this, of God's family, amen, um, and we're focused on Jesus, uh, but along with that comes different bits of our history and our, our family connections. And I serve with MB Foundation. We're a stewardship ministry that, that serves this MB church family. And so we've got a little bit of a display table out here by the Welcome Center. And my wife and I will be out there later. We'll be happy to visit with you and answer any questions you might have about who the Mennonite Brethren are or who MB Foundation is in any way that we might be able to serve you. As was mentioned, the title for this series, two-week series, is Real Life. And it's based on a short passage in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. And I believe that what we're going to talk about these next two Sundays is absolutely critical to experiencing a Jesus-centered life. Real life. Life that God intended us to live. It's very hard to know what's real these days. You know, we see pictures, whether they're on the internet or in a studio, and we really don't know what's real or what's fake. 
what's been added, what existed when that photo was really taken, we have no idea anymore, right? We don't know how it's been cropped, doctored up, or just completely computer generated. What is real is hard to determine. We built a new house about a year ago, and as we looked at wood flooring, I had to ask a number of times, uh, so is, is this real wood? I didn't think I'd ever ask that question. Here I am, not knowing what wood is real. And don't get me started in the food department. Today we have to check the products to know if we're buying real milk, real butter. I never thought that the ultimate burger, no offense anyone, I never thought I'd, that the ultimate burger wouldn't have beef in it, okay? I don't know what's real anymore. And now we don't even know what life is real. With the emphasis on fantasy and sports and Hollywood and gaming and drugs and escape rooms, metaverse, the alternate universe, do we really know what is real life anymore? You might be here this morning wondering if a Jesus-centered life is real. Whether we recognize it or not, we're all seeking real life. We're all seeking purpose and meaning, but we don't know where to turn all the time. As we celebrate Mother's Day today, we honor motherhood and the creation of new life. Yet even as we celebrate, I, I love the fact that this isn't mother, it's not Mother's Day because we don't have mothers apparently. We have moms, all right? I learned that, that was awesome. Anyway, I, 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 I digress. Uh, but we celebrate the gift of life that mothers uniquely are able to bring into this world. But I'm reminded about how in John chapter three, Jesus said we must be born again. And the phrase created confusion for those who heard it. They didn't understand how we can be born a second time. And it had to raise the question of what's really real? Which, which birth is real? The real birth. Well, I'm talking about real life, and you might have a, the same struggle today. After all, we, we're alive, so what's more real than that? Marvin Gaye recorded a song in 1968. It said, Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Ain't nothing like the real thing. I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> ah, love that. I saw someone lip syncing with me there. 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19, Paul gives us some excellent counsel on how to view money and how to take hold of real life. In fact, he tells us how we can view and use money in order to experience real life, the real thing, because there ain't nothing like the real thing. As we get started, you might be opening your Bibles to 1 Timothy 6, and I'll give you a little quick background. In 1 Timothy, we've got a letter written by Paul, the church elder statesman, to Timothy, a young pastor, a young missionary, a young church leader, and he gives us some instruction for how to lead that church. Fascinating letter. And in chapter one, he gives, uh, excuse me, in chapter two, he provides some instructions for church worship. So Ben, you take a look at that if you haven't before. I'm sure you have. But in chapter three, Paul gives instructions for church leadership. You might want to check that out, Joe. In chapters five and six, Paul gives instructions for ministry to the widows, to the elders, to the slaves that are among them. And at the end of the letter, the latter half of chapter six, Paul describes how to minister to those who are the wealthy in the church. Now, some of you might've just checked out when I said that this is now a ministry to the wealthy in the church. Well, I, I'm asking you to, to just hang in there with me and see if there isn't something that we share this morning that will speak to you as well. And so with that background in mind, let's turn to 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19, and I'm going to read the passage out of the New Living Translation. Tell those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone, but their trust should be in the living God who richly gives us 
all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give generously to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. And by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of real life. Let's work our way through this passage, three short verses, and see if we can't find some clues for us as to how we can take hold of real life. Well, in verse 17, there's, there's four words that really catch my attention, and we have to dwell on them just a bit. At the very first of the passage, it's, it uses the word, tell those who are rich. Tell. Other, other translations, the NIV says, command those who are rich. The King James Version says, charge those who are rich. This is military language. This is strong language. This isn't just a suggestion like we often give our children. This is a command. He's saying, command those who are rich. Charge them with these urgent words. Make sure they listen. The second word that you, you can't miss is tell those who are rich. The word rich is used a number of times. I'm sure you're focusing on that. Again, you might be thinking, well, this isn't for me because I'm not one of those who needs this command because I'm not rich. Well, let's talk for a moment about who the rich are in this world. I, when I think of the word rich, I want to think of people like Jeff Bezos, you know, LeBron James, Bill Gates, people that kind of get it way out there and I don't, I don't have to relate to their wealth. Uh, you, who do you think of when you think of the rich? Maybe just ponder for a moment. What comes to mind for you when you think of this word rich? Who comes to mind? Maybe not a specific person. Maybe you're thinking of the people that live in Cherry Creek. Maybe there's a different neighborhood now that comes to mind for you. According to a Gallup poll done a few, year, a few years ago, the public's definition of rich was either an income of $120,000 or more or assets of $1 million or more. Are you rethinking who the rich are in this world? We can drill a little deeper and get a little more personal. If you're a typical family of four in the United States, and have a household income of $80,000 or more, you're in the top 5% of the richest people in the world. If you're single and make $29,000, you are in the richest 5% of the global population. Tell those who are rich in this world. So I have some good news and bad news. <laughs> The good news is that most of us here today, I'll go out on a limb and say most of us here today are the rich in this world. The bad news is that that means this passage is for us. There's something for us to learn today from 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Well, the third word that jumps off the page for me is trust. You see it used twice in verse 17. Paul tells us not to trust in our money, but to put our trust or hope in God. And this idea of trusting in God is contrasted with the pride we often feel when we place it in our own abilities to earn money and succeed, and it's, we think it's often based on our own skill and our own talents. And it reminds me of what Moses, how he warned the Israelites when they were on the verge of entering into the promised land, he said, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. This is such a difficult challenge in our American economic system. After all, whose name is on the title to your car out in the parking lot? 
Or what about on the deed to your house, your paycheck, whose name is on it? What about your checking account? You know what I mean, young people, by checking account? Okay, your bank account. (laughs) Whose name is on that? It's yours. We identify ourselves with all of those possessions, and yet everything we have is from God. The skills and abilities are those that he has given to us. Everything we're able to earn comes from him, it's by him, and should be used to please him. And so the first ingredient for taking hold of real life is to properly put our perspective on God and not on money, stuff, or our own ability to create wealth. So if you're pursuing success, material possessions, a larger retirement account, instead of pursuing God and placing your trust in him, you're pursuing life that's an imposter. It's not the real thing. On April 23, 1985, the Coca-Cola company took arguably the biggest risk in consumer goods history, announcing that it was changing the formula for the world's most popular soft drink. It was the first formula change in 99 years. Do you remember this historic event? I know a lot of young people here, just trust me, it happened, okay? You can Google it later. I lived through it. This was right before we got married. They created Coca-Cola that was no longer real. They called it New Coke, but it was bad. It wasn't the real thing. And 79 days later, they returned to the original formula. For a while, they called the, the original formula Coke Classic. And we had New Coke and Coke Classic. No one bought New Coke. Everybody went back to Coke Classic. Today, it's once again referred to as simply Coke. I grew up hearing real life calls for real taste, for the taste of your life, Coca-Cola. But one fatal day, they took what we all enjoyed and made it a fake imitation of the real thing. Are you making the life God intended a fake imitation of the real thing? by putting your trust in money? Have you changed the formula by being prideful and trusting your own accomplishments rather than trusting the God of the universe? Keep thinking about that, but let's, let's move into something that feels a little bit more positive. The fourth word I wanna draw our attention to in verse 17 is the word enjoyment. You like that? The very last word of verse 17, he says, God has richly blessed us for our enjoyment. I love that. It's very positive. God does want us to enjoy the blessings that he bestows on us, but he wants us to have a proper attitude on those blessings, to see who provided those for us, to see where they came from, and to understand that all glory goes back to him as we enjoy those things. Romans 1.25 says, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. As you enjoy what God has provided, do you give praise to God? Or do you begin to worship and serve those things rather than God? Have you ever purchased something you really wanted and then find yourself a slave to that new item? You find yourself maintaining it, waxing it, getting insurance for it, um, worrying about it. The things that are supposed to bring us great joy often begin to become the owner of us. We quickly become a servant to the things that we wanted to serve us. So that brings us to the end of verse 17, but all of that is just setting the stage so that our hearts are open to hearing how God wants to use money to help us take hold of real life. Verse 18 says, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give generously to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. Do you wanna take hold of real life? If so, the key is right here in verse 18. 
in the food service industry, everyone wants you to believe that they have the secret sauce, right? I grew up, again, I'm, I'm lots of flashbacks this morning, but, you know, the Big Mac had the secret sauce, and it was a secret. Kentucky Fried Chicken has the secret recipe, and, you know, it'd be terrible if we knew what it was. I'm so glad that God doesn't hide from us the secret ingredient for taking hold of real life. He spells it right out. In verse 18, the secret ingredient is generosity. Paul says it in four different ways that we should be generous. He says, use your money to do good. Be rich in good works. Give generously to those in need. Always ready to share. Living a life with our hands open. Enjoying what God puts in our hands in trust to us for a season. But ready to share it with others as God calls us and directs us to. We'll unpack this generous life more fully next Sunday. But the key for today is just knowing that generosity is the secret to taking hold of real life. It says in verse 19, by doing this, what, what is this? By doing the things in verse 18, by using our money to do good, by being rich in good works, by giving generously to those in need, by being ready to share, by doing those things, they, the wealthy, we're the wealthy, will be storing up our treasure as a good foundation and taking hold of real life. Sometimes this passage is spoken of as though it's a, it's a future tense. We'll take hold of real life when we get to eternity, when we store up treasures in heaven, then we'll get there to real life, that eternal life. And I think there's an element of that in this passage, but I think it's so much more than that. While we're here on this earth, we get to experience real life when we live the way that God intended us to live. The NIV says we'll take hold of the life that's truly life. In the book, Tuck Everlasting, one of the characters says, don't be afraid of death, Winnie. Be afraid of the unlived life. That's my fear for you. It's my fear for me. That we would live the unlived life. Too many Christians have placed their trust in God and they, they honestly seek to grow as disciples, but they fail to take hold of real life by living a generous lifestyle. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Or I memorized it, have it more abundantly. In the New Living Translation, it says to have the rich and satisfying life. When someone changed the recipe of Coca-Cola, to those of us who enjoy Coke, it was like the thief had come in and destroyed what we loved. Even though they said real life calls for real taste, they had changed the taste, and we weren't enjoying the real taste or real life. And as far as drinking Coke was concerned, it was not the real thing. The same is true for you and me when it comes to our Christian life and how we view our money. When we substitute vacations, cars, bank accounts, houses, hobbies, pleasure, worldly success for generosity. We're substituting worldly things for real life. And the thief has stolen, killed, and destroyed, preventing us from having real life and having it to the full. At the end of verse 17, we highlighted that word enjoyment. Well, I believe there's a connection between that word and also this idea of generosity because I think there's no more pleasure that you and I can have than when we use what God has provided to us to live the generous life. We will experience enjoyment. 
a couple of quotes. Helen, who's a marketing consultant, says, I believe biblical generosity is the key to unlocking greater freedom and joy in our lives. And someone I know by the name of Greg said, giving money is the most fun way to spend money. My wife and I would agree with that. So 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19 tells us exactly how we can take hold of real life. First, we lay the groundwork by not being proud or arrogant about what we have, by not putting our trust and confidence in money, but rather to put our trust and hope in God, to enjoy the gifts he has given us, but also to recognize that we're a conduit designed to use the money that comes through our fingers and our bank accounts to do good, to be rich in good works and taking hold of real life. I want to close quickly with a story from John Wesley, one of my favorite stewardship heroes. Maybe you've heard about John. He, he has, he's famous for this line, uh, make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. An often misunderstood quote from him, but let me just share briefly. Uh, John actually grew up in grinding poverty. His father was a priest, but he, he couldn't make ends meet, and he was actually marched off to debtor's prison on several occasions. And John Wesley decided to also go into the same vocation, but he decided to do it a little differently and, and went to Oxford University where he became a teacher. And he received an annual salary of 30 pounds and it allowed him to live quite comfortably. And one day when he had just finished decorating his apartment with pictures, the chambermaid came to his apartment and, to see if he needed anything and he looked at her, it was a cold day, and she had just a linen rag, just a thin thing to protect her from the cold. And he became extremely convicted, and he was like, did, did these, these portraits that I have here, they could have clothed this poor lady. And he reached into his pocket to get some money for her, and he had nothing to give to her, just a couple of coins. He became very convicted by that. And so he, he repositioned his life, and he began to limit his expenses so he would have money to give to the poor. He records that in 1731, his income was 30 pounds and his living expenses 28. And so he gave away two pounds. That's almost a tithe. So he's doing pretty good, 10%. The next year, his income doubled, but he still lived on 28 pounds and he gave away 32. Okay, keep doing the math here with me. I'm gonna rattle it off. Third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds he, and he gave 62 away. The fourth year, he earned 120 pounds, lived on 28, and gave 92 to the poor. Wesley preached that Christians should not merely tithe, but give all extra income once the family and creditors were met to give it away. That's what he meant by save all you can so that you can give it all away. And he practiced what he preached throughout his lifetime. In one year, he, he earned 1,400 pounds and he gave everything away except 30 pounds. I love that. He raised his standard of living by two pounds. His reports show that he never possessed as much as 100 pounds at one time. And when he died in 1791, the only money mentioned in his will was the miscellaneous coins to be found in his pockets and his dresser drawers. Most of the 30,000 pounds he had earned in his lifetime, he had given away. I think it's fair to say that John Wesley had learned to put his hope in God rather than money. He lived out the verses to use his money to do good, to be rich in good works, to give generously to those in need and be ready to share. And by doing so, he was able to take hold of real life, of the life that's truly life. I wanna leave you this morning with, with three questions. Three questions that I'd love for you to jot down. Maybe just one of the questions is important for you that the Spirit would put on your heart. Maybe there's something else, but these are three that came to mind that I would love for you to ponder as the day or the week goes on in preparation for next Sunday. Number one, how do you respond to the reality that you are rich? What does that do in your spirit? How does that change your attitude, your perspective on life? Number two, how might you better exhibit in your life that your trust is in the living God rather than in stuff? 
if you believe that to be true, how can it be better reflected in how you live your life, how you go day to day, how you view the next paycheck, how you look at work, how you look at going shopping? And number three, what change do you need to make in order to really take hold of life that's truly life? What does that look like for you? This is no cookie cutter approach. I'm not gonna stand up here and say generosity means X or Y other than what it says in 1 Timothy 6, 18. What does it look like for you to better take hold of the real life? Don't look back and find that you lived the unlived life. We have a Coca-Cola here for you today. As you leave, you you need to go to the Welcome Center and, and pick up a Coke. And you can drink it right away as you leave, that's fine, no instructions. But if you choose to wait till later today or maybe sometime during the week, maybe that's a time where you can sip the real thing and ponder what it means to live life, the real life that God has intended for you and for me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this this opportunity this morning to look at, at these instructions that Paul, you gave to Paul, Paul gave to Timothy, and Timothy was instructed to pass along to the wealthy of this world. Lord, it's hard to, to imagine that we're even any way in that arena of being the wealthy in this world, but yet the statistics show us that we are. And sometimes we feel like we're just, we're just hanging on, we're just getting through day to day, and yet, we're wealthy by the world's standards. Lord, help us to grasp that and then to move past that, put in our trust and our hope in you to contemplate, to prayerfully consider what does it look like for us to take hold of real life by living the generous life that you've intended. Lord, I pray that any words I shared that were not helpful this morning would just slip away and be forgotten as we leave here today. Lord, that the truth of these words, the message that you want to bring would rest firmly on our hearts and our minds. It's in your name we pray.